Yeah, hello everyone. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I know it's pretty late. We are all tired, but yeah, we can get to this together. Yeah, before we start, let us introduce ourselves. Sure. Uh, my name is Vincent. I'm software engineer for AWS, and I'm also a committer for Apache Airflow. Jarek Potiuk, uh, maintainer, TMC member of Apache Airflow. And my name is Mateusz Hens. I work as a senior software engineer in Cloud Composer at Google. And yeah, today we're going to talk about multi-tenancy. But before we start, let's first define how we understand multi-tenancy and to, to make sure we are on the same page. Uh, so yeah, like the, the story about multi-tenancy started a few years ago in Cloud Composer. We actually look at our fleet and we found that there are a lot of environments that uh, are for installations that actually seems idle for the most of the day. So they, they were just executing that for a few hours a day or maybe sometimes a week. And uh, yeah, we, we of course uh, knew that the idle cost of the environment is not something that we can like simply ignore. So we trigger a discussion, like first we within our team, uh, then we uh, reach out to the community. And uh, yeah, we, we, we got some, I think, obvious conclusions and ways to solve. So first of all, we want to run uh, we want to run a single shared database and that, that can be used uh, with multiple Airflow installations. Then some components like scheduler, web server, can should still be executed in the as a single instance as they are independent from the uh, user and uh, DAC code. Then each team must have a fully isolated environment. It means dedicated set of workers, DAC processors, running in isolations from other tenants, just to avoid any security issues, noisy neighbor problems. But uh, still, uh, must be able to use different dependencies like PyPy packages, uh, maybe uh, airflow configuration or uh, environment variables. Of course, each tenant defined connections and variables must be hidden from another tenant. And finally, there must be some authentication integrated with, with uh, SSO. This is mainly related to the enterprises, which would like rather to use their own SSO providers than using built-in uh, what, what we have in Airflow. Multi-tenancy, of course, not for everyone. Uh, so yeah, small teams or individuals probably don't need it. Medium companies, big companies, with multiple airflow installations, uh, we probably use it to reduce the cost of the of the fleet and the, the maintenance burden. So yeah, most likely. And service providers like Google Cloud or AWS, we could use it similarly to reduce the cost for our customers and limit the number of airflow installations in our fleets. But I think, uh, as we agreed with Vincent, we probably would like to limit the multi-tenancy level to per customer to to limit to re to reduce the potential risk of any leaks or uh, security issues. Okay. So the whole effort started uh, from two AIPs. The first was AIP 43. So it was, it was about uh, separating DAC processor from the scheduler. This AIP is already implemented and uh, like present in Airflow from multiple versions. Uh, right now we are focusing on AIP 44, which is about introducing an internal API. So why? The rationale for this change is the fact that all components that we have currently in Airflow have direct access to the database, usually with the full root uh, permissions. So the, the problems, uh, the, the, the bigger problem is for the, these three components, trigger, DAC processor, and worker, as they may run user code, like DAC code, which may run a query on the database. So for example, reading variables and connections is not a problem and they may even affect the task execution state. So we would like to uh, solve it, and what we, we proposed was we introducing some new proxy component, we called it internal API, and uh, all these three components can get a read data from the database only through that uh, new component. Uh, it exposed only the required methods, uh, so the list of operational database is strictly limited and actually uh, controlled by uh, Airflow code. And there is no no need to actually the, the, the direct access to the database will be uh, prohibited. 
So where are we there? The internal component is there. You can you can use it. You can run it uh, right now. Uh, right now we are focused on migrating all database methods uh, from uh, like in these three in these three components to make sure they can be that they use internal API instead of uh, database uh, queries directly. So yeah, the, the migration in the, during the migration we try to do, we try to uh, avoid duplicating the code. Uh, and we try to do it in a uh, backward compatible manners. There are some tricky parts in their flow, so it actually caused us uh, scratching our heads trying to understand what's actually going on in this particular uh, method. And uh, yeah, there was uh, a lot of detail analysis and discussion between us uh, how to do it. Right now, uh, two components, DAC processor and triggerer, are fully migrated. Just a note some PRs are still in review, so maybe not not in uh, Airflow uh, GitHub head, but hopefully will be, they will be soon merged. Uh, and uh, we are focusing right now on the uh, worker and uh, making sure the task execution can be run in this DPS mode. After that, uh, we're going to migrate operators that we have in the Airflow, making, making sure that they also use the internal API instead of direct uh, DB access. After that, uh, when everything is migrated, we're gonna introduce new continuous integration tests just to make sure no new methods uh, or actually no new direct DB access is introduced in the, the, the new new code. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna have run this test in DBLS mode. And yeah, finally, right now we uh, aim for alpha version for Airflow 2.8. Uh, yeah, we are aware that we are that this all these changes impacts the Airflow core uh, components and of course. That the changes will require a lot of tests, both performance, regressions. So this, this will be the point where we will count on you uh, help and then feedback will be highly appreciated. And that's me, Thank you. Um, so now we're going we're going we're going to talk about uh, another AIP, um, AIP fifty six, which is the um, introduction of um, extens extensible user management. So, um, in order, in order to explain what's AIP 56, uh, let's see where we at before AIP 56 and where we want to be after, uh, the AIP. So this is where we at. Uh, the, the important part, the important part here is, uh, here, the user management. Uh, as you can see in this diagram, is part of Coreflow and deeply into deeply integrated with Coreflow and all its components. Um, so there's two there's two problems with this. Um, first is uh, if you want to modify the user management, uh, you need to update Coreflow, um, which can be can be cumbersome sometimes. Uh, second is all users don't need the uh, same uh, the same user management. I don't think uh, an individual, a single individual, and a big company needs the same user management. Um, so to fix this, uh, we want to extract out the user management uh, from Core Airflow and move it to a new component called uh, Fab Auth Manager. Um, so Fab Auth Manager basically packages all the user management that was that was part of Core Airflow and move it to a new component uh, called Auth Manager. Um, so what does it change for the user? Nothing. Um, so why doing it then? Um, the ultimate the ultimate goal of uh, packaging the user management um, into a new component called uh, Auth Manager is to be able to use different one depend depending on your need. Again, if you're a single individual or like a big company, you don't need the same user management. Um, so by default, uh, Fab Auth Manager uh, will be uh, uh, will be used uh, in Airflow, uh, but but if user wants to use a different ones, they can. Um, so here, for instance, the user uh, uses Auth Manager A uh, instead of Fab Auth Manager. Uh, Auth Manager A implement its own logic, its own authentication, its own authorization. Uh, Auth Manager A might, might implement some fancy logic like having tenants or can be just a very, very simplistic uh, Auth Manager. Uh, so now we explain uh, what's AIP 56. Let's uh, understand 
let's understand better uh, what's, uh, what is an auth manager. Um, so the auth manager is basically the common API for user management, which includes uh, user authentication and user author authorization. Um, so in, the, in this example, uh, the user wants to list uh, the, you, the user wants to list the list of variables in their environment. Um, the first action Airflow does is actually checking if the user is allowed to do so. Uh, so to, to make this check, Airflow calls um, the auth manager used uh, in, in the environment, uh, called the is authorized API, which will basically tell you if the user is allowed or denied to do uh, such action. Um, the auth manager uh, can be in a provider, but the interface defining what's the um, what's an auth manager is in Coreflow. So what's the status of AIP56? Um, defining the auth manager interface I just mentioned previously, I will I will say 90% done. All those are only estimation, so please bear with me. Um, migrating the core, core Airflow code, uh, the Airflow code to use auth manager, uh, I would estimate it to 40%. Uh, implementing the fab auth manager, I would say 60. The fourth and um, most important, I would say, uh, implementing another auth manager based on external tools. On, based on external tools. So here I took the example of Keyclock, but that, that can be basically anything. And this work hasn't started, and that's basically where uh, we need you, because uh, again, we are uh, a community. So um, if you, uh, AP56 will be really finalized uh, when, we have, when we will have multiple auth manager. Uh, so, so far only fab auth manager is getting worked on, uh, but that would be amazing. That Oh, yeah. But that would be amazing to have a uh, multiple auth manager uh, relying on other tools, such as, again, Keyclock, but that can be, like, it can be basically any tool. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please uh, be my guest. Uh, go ahead, ping us, or just uh, create a discussion, an issue, just send a Slack message on the, on the Slack community. Uh, but uh, yeah, we need you. Uh, so what's missing uh, on the multi-tenancy uh, topic? Uh, first thing uh, that is very important is multi-tenancy multi is not like a single feature where uh, you create a PR, uh, you get some comments, you address those comments, you have some static checks failure, of course, so you fix those failure, you fix them, you get it approved, you go home and you're happy. Uh, it's not, it doesn't work like this. Uh, it's not a turnkey solution. It's, uh, it's an iteration of a uh, multiple feature. Um, so Airflow as a platform uh, allow building multi-tenancy block by blocks. So uh, this block have already been mentioned in this presentation, but I'm just going to repeat. So the first is AIP43, uh, which is the DAG processor separation. This one is done. And Second one is AIP44, uh, the internal API that Mateusz, Mateusz just men mentioned previously. Uh, this is work in progress. And AIP56, as we just uh, saw, is uh, also work in progress. Uh, so what do we miss? Yarek. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so uh, when we started the whole journey of, um, uh, of, uh, of multi-tenancy, we had a vision that it will go farther, far and far and we'll get like a turnkey multi-tenant solution of Airflow. But as Vincent mentioned, now the thinking is like Airflow is a platform and allows you to build your own multi-tenant solution on top of uh, whatever building blocks we have. This is, the, this is our goal right now. And this means that we don't uh, miss that much. First of all, uh, and let me start from saying that I've been explaining uh, in a number of issues where people ask me how to do multi-tenancy. Uh, first of all, it's not there yet, but if you really try hard, and there will be some talks uh, tomorrow from World Simple, you can implement it even now, except the internal API, except the database access, which is, uh, which is not really possible. All the rest you could implement right now. It's just a little bit cumbersome and difficult to do. So 
the first thing we will have to do is just to document how to how to approach it, how to do it, and that you can you can do it. Uh, we thought initially that we need a pertinent access to resources. So like, uh, uh, and yes, we do. So each tenant should be able to access their own resources, their own DAGs, their own tasks, uh, connections and variables, and the other tenants shouldn't add, uh, shouldn't add it. So this is a feature we miss, and that's something that we will have to implement. Uh, we also need uh, per-tenant system dependencies. This is something that uh, is uh, people are asking a lot. Like I can have several teams. Each of my teams work on several on separate DAGs. They have their own dependencies, so they need to have a separate environment to run their DAGs on. Uh, and this is something that we certainly need. But there was one thing uh, which we initially thought that we will need, and that was something that uh, we left for the future, which is like per-task authorization to API. So right now, through the API internal call, you can modify your task and you can modify another task. And like this is this is like pretty open right now. The, the, this access doesn't prevent you from doing that. And the question was like, do we actually? Uh, so initially, we wanted to authorize task to only do things for its for 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 the for the whole for the task only and nothing else. And that makes the whole solution quite complex. But we think we don't probably don't need it and. Uh, uh, the solution that we are going to propose as next step, next API, uh, uh, next AAP, uh, will be uh, to not implement this, but just limit the what internal API allows you to do with the database to your own tenant. But uh, you'll be able to still modify a lot of things in the database, but only in, inside your tenant. You will not be able to access the tasks and DAGs and connections and resources of the other tenant. But all the rest you should be able to access. And uh, how, how how will it look like? Uh, eventually, uh, eventually, what what we really wanted to achieve is like your tenant has this components separated, uh, and Mateusz already explained that. Like the, there is a mm, uh, DAC file processor trigger internal API and workers which are running in your tenant environment, and you also have, and this is this is the important uh, decision that we can make right now that your tenant is limited to a DAC subfolder, and just that assumption that you have a DAC subfolder which is tenant which is assigned to this tenant, make the implementation of the next step a little bit easier, or quite a bit easier, and we can provide a solution that if you go, each tenant has a separate DAX folder, then you can use whatever building blocks Airflow will provide. The rest of the things will remain common, so like database, scheduler, web server will be common, or shared, and each tenant will have its own DAX folder and all the components that are using it. So this is the idea. Every tenant will have their own separate set of components, but how do we make sure that uh, uh, this whole solution is secure, that there is an isolation between one tenant and the others? Uh, and uh, we thought about that, we discussed, and then there is, uh, it seems that there is a one simple solution that kills all the birds even with single stone, which means that we need really to implement one AIP next, that looks like it's going to be the other. Um, and the solution is based on queues. So we already have queues in Airflow, which are bound to salary. Uh, and you can have like task belonging to a queue and will be executed in a specific queue. Uh, and this queue can be bound to a specific worker, which is run on salary. And we thought, okay, this is uh, this is quite cool. Why will, why won't we name the queue as a tenant uh, and add the, this capability that we have queues now? across the board of all the other components. And again, this is a proposal. This is not yet finally set or agreed on. This is something that we think might work, uh, and that's going to be proposed uh, soon. Uh, so one queue equals one tenant equal, equals the DAX subfolder where all the DAX for this tenant are. OK, so how do we make sure the DAX file processor, uh, that all the files processed by the uh, from this single folder, folder belong to the queue. That should be quite simple because we already have the AP43 implemented and with separate DAC file processor per, per subfolder. We can make this subfolder equals to the queue. How exactly we do that, that's up to the definition. Uh, so tenant equals queue equals subfolder. Uh, and we have per tenant or per queue, per DAC subfolder, a separate standalone processor. So like we're just an Airflow DAC processor with the tenant or queue 
parameter, tenant is a working tenant right now, which means that all the DAGs and all the tasks in this particular uh, DAG subfolder will automatically get Q assigned uh, from this DAG, uh, from, uh, which is equal to the tenant. Right now, Q is assigned by, by the DAG author, but in this case, we'll just force it and just uh, say, okay, all the, for all the DAGs be coming from, the different, from this subfolder has this Q. And this will propagate across all the system. So, uh, and also this allows already, and this is possible like half per tenant or per queue per DAX subfolder uh, image where the DAX file processor is parsing those those DAX. So this is just adding the flag to the uh, to the DAX file processor to force the tenant will be enough to make it make sure that all the DAX belonging to one folder come from that tenant. Uh, trigger it's very simple. We add an, another flag. We already can have support for multiple uh, triggers. So having tenant uh, trigger with a with a with a tenant flag or queue flag will only process the deferred tasks with the tasks which are coming from uh, which have the, this queue assigned. Which means that uh, this trigger will only be processing tasks and tasks coming from this uh, single uh, tenant. Uh, and same, Trigger can have its own environment where the dependencies are installed specific for this particular tenant. Everything is isolated to the same dependencies. Workers, we already have it. So we prob probably <laughs> don't need to do anything, just rename ten queue to tenant. And the, the, the worker will only process uh, tasks belonging to this particular uh, tenant coming from this particular DAX subfolder parsed by this particular DAX file processor. And the same, the same thing about environment. It will have the same environment for uh, for execution this time. Uh, internal API server. This is one thing that we will have to add as well. Internal API minus minus tenant will only accept and process and check the anything that we want to access in the database that belongs to a particular tenant. And this a internal API will be exclusive for this tenant will accept only uh, this specific tenant uh, request and it will access only the tenant data, including uh, environment and including per tenant connection and variables. So this means that we will have to also extend the connections and variables to have a tenant or queue uh, uh, attribute. So say, okay, this connection belongs to this tenant uh, or this variable belongs to this tenant and only those connections will be accessible by uh, by this internal API server. Uh, web server, AIP56 to the rescue. Uh, you can, you will, once AIP56 is implemented, you will be able to implement your auth manager, which again, you will be able to map your like group of users, should be able to ask particular uh, tenant information to particular queue, to use that particular queue and see, okay, you only see the DAGs belonging to your queue and nothing else which currently is not really possible. Which means that we are probably looking at AIP58, explaining how this all should be implemented, which parameters should be added, but there doesn't seem to be like a complex new things to be that we have to develop, just propagate the, the tenant flag across the system and make it possible to run. Uh, so I would say multi-tenancy is almost here because it's not like because like it's soon or like next week or next month. It's just, we thought initially that we need to implement a lot more to get the multi-tenancy working, but it seems that right now, if we limit that to like DAX, DAX subfolder equals Q equals tenant and propagate it across all the components, it's all already po it will be already possible for anyone to build their own tenant, uh, multi-tenant uh, implementation, uh, providing that we will tell the users how to do that. We probably won't gonna provide a like Helm chart ready to use that uh, that you can uh, deploy and have multi tenant environment that makes very little sense. But we will tell you, okay, in order to run tenant, you have to have this uh, separate uh, separate Docker container, uh, run all your components with this tenant flag for your tenant, separate the network so that they can only talk to each other internally in this tenant, and put uh, assign the tenant to a subfolder of the DAG and all the DAGs in this particular subfolder belongs to that tenant. And then the you 
will be able the, the 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 one who is deploying that will be able to assign the rights to write this DAC folder for this particular tenant uh, users and and that's it. That's the, the tenant. So this is our idea. 